spiritual leaders of this country. Your challenge is to foster a nation in which all people, irrespective of race, color, sex, religion, or creed, can accept a social cohesion fully. outside help. Outside help is, is welcome and we graciously accept it, but we must also look at how to mobilize resources ourselves. The African Union must take a clear position on this issue. This event is symbolic for us. It marks the anniversary of the founding charter of the Organization of African Unity that was replaced by the African Union. Today is the 50th anniversary of institutional African Unity. Therefore, Grilla took the initiative to mark this occasion following what happened since its 2011 declaration on the states of the continent. On a geostrategic level, a process of recolonization is underway. There is an economic plundering and the integration process of the African continent is still quite fragile. So, what we stated in the 2011 declaration must be acknowledged, but the situation has become worse. Since that time, there have been several military interventions on the African continent. The ambiguous behavior of several African states persists, mainly on the military issue. But more seriously, there has been strong divisions amongst African people and nations on the major cases of occupation. We do not want AFRICOM to move on to the African continent. During the research process that we undertook, we realized that the level of co-optation of our African armies is very advanced and that the majority of our countries are under military tutelage. So even though the move of Africa may seem like a formality at this stage because officially no African country wants this America base on its territory, the NATO forces are determined to find a stable African country to house this base. Our information indicates that several African nations are actually making offers to be the chosen location, but the Americans are dismissing these offers. The unique nature of this declaration is that it is done in the name of African and German citizens. The German did not choose either to have an American base for African in their backyard. They were not consulted in Parliament. It is a sort of a fait accompli that dates back to the vestiges of the Cold War. That is to say that Germany already has an American base, but this base is a new base. The United States and the George Bush Jr. decided that the three large bases that controlled the area were not enough and that a fourth one was necessary just for the African continent. And that is the special nature of the 21st century. We can certainly speculate on why they want to do this. Is it really the terrorist security risk? Is it the incapacity of our African countries to protect themselves? Is it the scramble for resources that the emerging BRICS countries are exacerbating that justify these maneuvers? Regardless, Africa should be the first to be blamed for our incapacity to defend ourselves and especially the fact that the African Union 
which we must not forget, was formed due to the political initiative of Gaddafi, is now more and more aligned with NATO. We will not only have serious problem of restructuring, but also regarding the position of how we should protect ourselves. We posted the declaration on our website in Swahili, Arabic, Portuguese, English, French, German, Italian, Amharic, Spanish. The work that we undertook to draft the declaration was colossal. We must thank all of the volunteers and the interpreters because it was sensitive and confidential work, so we could not just give it to professional interpreters. We had to give it to activists, people who understood why we were doing this. According to the American Air Force, no drone strikes can be carried out without the Ramstein Relay Station. Several surveillance operations, as well as targeted assassinations, were likely performed in the name of the war on terrorism. The last frontier in the North African region that is being disrupted is Algeria. Although Algeria continues to resist, it remains in an ambiguous relationship with NATO. While all the territories within the Maghreb have been destabilized or brought to their knees, Algeria appears to be the last territory in the geopolitical remapping of the Sahelian and Mediterranean region. <laughs> There are bright days ahead for the ongoing manipulation of the security agenda. Well, as always, uh, it's a great opportunity to, uh, to listen to the president and to discuss matters of uh, mutual concern. And the principal topic which we discussed today was about the security situation in Mali. And we had uh, a very thorough discussion, but I think the, the principle is the, the first thing that must happen is the immediate return of civilian control in Mali. The maneuvers of AFRICOM in Algeria, the beginning of the end of the Bouteflika regime, the internal struggles of the fundamentalist forces of imperialism, are well illustrated by the hegemonic role of regional powers such as Qatar. General David Rodriguez is the new leader of U.S. Africa Command, taking over today for retiring General Carterham. At the change of command ceremony in Stuttgart, Germany, General Rodriguez said he would work to build on the relationships General Ham has established with African, European, and other international partners. African partners, Department of State, interagency partnerships are invaluable to understanding how the United States should support the African nations. We choose the African territory of Algeria to launch our declaration, AFRICOM Go Home, on the 50th anniversary of the independence of African nations, thereby amplifying the vision of Franz Fanon. This force, AFRICOM, launched by the Bush administration, 
claims to protect the security of the United States by reinforcing the capacities of African states against transnational threats and by fostering sustainable and harmonious development. The prospect of the establishment of AFRICOM, rejected for the moment by most African states, is appealing to some nations. What one has to understand is that NATO nations do not really need a base. They come and they go as they please, and they have done that practically since the time of independence. However, for the 21st century, this base would allow them to secure those spaces that already belong to them from the rapacious economic appetite of emerging powers such as China, India or Brazil. But beyond the issue of the base, it is the way in which our armies have become surrogate, how they have been integrated and co-opted by the imperialist military structure. We propose instead a pan afri centrage, a self-reliant development focused on food self-sufficiency, an agriculture strategy that would involve not just agrarian reform and food sovereignty. It would mean that all the stages and tasks involved in agriculture are valued and complement industry. We are not talking about an insular development. It is a development based on collective autonomy. Instead, today we witness a fragmentation of path toward development. This urgent wake-up calls entails a pan-Africanist or internationalist approach in order that our elites and people realize that the militarization of Africa is a dead end for us, which attracts and fuels conflict. The sovereignty of Africa must proceed with the dismantling of all foreign bases and the establishment of a continental African army devoted to the self-defense and maintaining peace. This requires continental integration, self-reliance towards social progress, which run counter to the co-optation and transformation of our armies into surrogates. These armies are often called upon to end conflict that have been fomented by external forces eager to control access to resources, both natural and human. They have been the rest of the earth and now the rest of the sea that you call Haraga. The brain drain and the flight of our productive resources are symptoms of the failure of development. We must have another kind of development based on a balanced system to rediscover our Africanity, Africanisms, values and virtues without narcissism. To emerge from our amnesia, fundamental principles like math, the balance with our vital forces must be restored. That is why we must demilitarize both states and terrorist groups, dismantle all foreign bases from Chagos, Ceuta, Diego Garcia, Libreville, Jamena, Djibouti. No to the multinational scramble for our resources. We are against land grabbing and dispossession. No to leaders who submit their countries to imperialism. We have to rediscover the room to maneuver of the state and popular movements, renationalize our resources, promote a continental and regional integration that is accelerated by the complementarity and equalization, rely on appropriate technology, and most importantly, we must have the total emancipation of women and transformation of male mentalities, the democratic repolitization of our youth. We must unveil the irresponsible and ostentatious consumerist behaviors and preserve our ecological balance that is so threatened. We must organize all the forces of the diaspora, whether progressive or not, for their return to the African continent and the use of their know-how. We must strive for a more humanistic, polycentric world and the preservation of the public commons. This issue of the commons is a new base for the rediscovery of internationalism. I close in saying, that no one can foresee the outcome of these struggles. The near future will depend on the socio-political, economical and cultural balance of power between classes, genders and generations. It is, as Fanon envisioned, the moment to create a new man and a new woman, to widen the scopes of society's response against the unilateral market forces and its global apartheid order by a humanist and, if possible, socialist project. Fanon writes, word that still live today, Africa must be free. Africa must be free, said Dr. Nkrumah during his inaugural speech. We have nothing to lose but our chains, and we will conquer a vast continent. In Accra, the Africans swore fidelity, loyalty, and assistance. 
and it is here in Algeria that it has happened. They need a base where they can house a minimum number of troops and conduct cyber surveillance and where their work can be clearly mapped out. And this is something that will be done via several programs which are documented in our declaration, many programs into which our countries have been inserted. 33 African countries have already been integrated within these programs. The essential components of the military hierarchy is already formed by these forces. The essence of these military maneuvers of operations is already embedded within our military forces. And all that remains is the establishment of this base. That is why we say that this base must not be imposed on the African continent. This base by no means must set foot on our sovereign space because it will make the potential for continental unification even more difficult. AFRICOM claims to protect and defend the interests of national security of the United States by reinforcing the self-defense capacities of African states and regional organizations. Following an order, AFRICOM can undertake military operations to oppose transnational threats in order to foster a secure environment favoring, it alleges, good governance and sustainable development. On May the 31st, 2013, the American Secretary of State, John Kerry, stated that all American actions, including those performed from Germany, are rigorously in compliance with the applicable laws in force. The delicate position of Germany, actor and victim of the Cold War, is that the Americans still have preferential status. The Germans are still torn between their capacity to proceed on their own and to make Europe an empire that pleases some German conservatives who are aligned with American hegemony. So thank you, Chancellor Merkel, for your leadership, your friendship, and the example of your life. The foreign policy of Germany in relation to Africa, in the name of collective security, has been defined since 2005. It is increasingly characterized by investment, trade, and the enforcement of security. Since 2005, the German army has regularly participated in military maneuvers in West Africa, like Flingstock of AFRICOM. What is the legitimacy of AFRICOM in Germany? The presence of German forces in Germany is based on a treaty of October the 23rd, 1954, related to stationary foreign armed forces. The rights and obligations of legionary armies of NATO member states based in Germany are governed by the Statute of NATO Troops of June 19, 1951, and completed by the Complementary Accord of June 3, 1959, regarding NATO troops. The liaison commander of the U.S. headquarters in Europe on the Stuttgart site dates back to the mid-1990s. The Memorandum of Agreement between the respective Defense Ministries regarding the establishment of a Joint Liaison Command called HQUS UCOM was signed on July 12, 1996. The German Bundeswehr maintains in Rammstein and in Stuttgart Liaison Commands VDKRDO with the US Air Force Units USAFE and the USAUCOM and US AFRICOM. The Liaison Command of the U.S. Air Force, maintained in Rammstein, has been in existence since June 1, 1996. I am on my way to the German Parliament to meet Linker members of Parliament. The Linker Party has been instrumental in the German opposition against the Iraq War and the war in Libya, despite of the crisis within the left. The Linker Party is a modern and pacifist party. We have our work cut out for us and a long work session before us in order to harmonize our positions. On June 14, 2013, the MPs submitted 30 questions before the German Parliament for the first time. 
MPs Nima Movasat and Heike Ansel, among others, had the courage to ask these questions. They have no hesitated to ask for the end of the free trade agreement between USA and Europe. They are outraged by the issues of intelligence and the presence of drones and attacks from Germany. We try to harmonize our positions. Known as neocons, this security quartet is still influencing American policy under the Obama administration. Rumsfeld and Cheney under Nixon in 1976-77 sabotaged peace with Eastern Europe by inventing the threat of weapons of mass destruction to relaunch the arms race. Since that time, they became much more powerful as Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense and U.S. Vice President. The financial side deals with Halliburton, Carlyle, and the incestuous relationships between the political arena and games of influence, as well as the legal veil of criminal operations, were such that ties between American neocons under George Bush Sr. and Al-Qaeda were severed. Powerful lobbies such as the Institute of Strategic Studies and the Project for a New American Century, but also think tanks such as the Bilderberg Club, advocate for a global governance of terror to replace the doctrine of mutual assured destruction of the Cold War era. The ambiguous support of the neocons and the Pentagon apparatus for the Muslim fundamentalists from the Middle East and from the Horn of Africa has resulted in a boomerang effect against the United States. We also have a history of kind of moving in and out of Pakistan. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia. And we went to work. And it was President Reagan, in partnership with the Congress, um, led by Democrats, who said, you know what, sounds like a pretty good idea. Let's deal with the ISI and the Pakistani military, and let's go recruit these Mujahideen, and that's great. Let's get some to come from Saudi Arabia and other places, importing their Wahhabi brand of Islam so that we can go beat the Soviet Union. And guess what? They retreated. They lost billions of dollars, and it led to the collapse of the Soviet Union. So there's a, a very strong argument, which is it wasn't a bad investment to end the Soviet Union, but let's be careful what we sow because we will harvest. In order to better understand this situation, we have to return to the past. The American foreign policy in Africa first failed in Angola, where they supported allies such as Jonas Savimbi and Holden Roberto. The South African and American defeat in Quito Canavale in front of the Angolan and Cuban forces in 1987, followed by the end of apartheid and the Somali Restore Hope operation, which was a fiasco, forced Washington to intensify the privatization of its bilateral relations. It also caused Washington to foster other, more incendiary alliances with Islamist extremists that were unpredictable and could not be controlled. So it was not in New York, but in Africa, in Dar es Salaam, that the first terrorist attacks occurred. In Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, the U.S. was targeted on August 7, 1998. The relationship between Al-Qaeda and the United States was over. The American embassy was destroyed and an obscure Islamic group called the Army of the Liberation of Holy Ground claimed responsibility for the attacks. The Saudi billionaire bin Laden, a former ally of the Americans, the Egyptian Saif al-Aden and the Comorian Fazul Abdullah were incriminated without revealing the links that they had with the Americans. The Clinton administration took advantage of its crusade against al-Qaeda in order to contain Sudan and to better position itself within the Great Lakes region. There, as elsewhere, the neoliberal development policies devoid of social justice robbed the African people of their dignity and exacerbated popular resentment, thereby pushing the more radical of the disenchanted towards extremism. The target was terror. Our mission was clear to strike at the network of radical groups affiliated with and funded by Osama bin Laden, perhaps the preeminent organizer and financier of international terrorism 
in the world today. The groups associated with him come from diverse places but share a hatred for democracy, a fanatical glorification of violence, and a horrible distortion of their religion to justify the murder of innocents. The links with the nebulous terrorists, the controversial attacks of September 11th, and the presumed masterminds of this tragedy, still unknown, overshadowed the issue regarding the actual location and state of the Pentagon's accounts, located in a wing of the Pentagon. The night before the attacks, Rumsfeld was complaining about the overly bureaucratic structure and the unexplained disappearance of $2.3 trillion. The military war industry had carte blanche to invade countries from Iraq to Libya. According to some estimates, we cannot track $2.3 trillion in transactions. The complicity between elements of the CIA and the Pentagon had finally disintegrated. I recall they said wanted, dead or alive. Obsession with the war on terror masks something else. In contrast with the Pan-Africanist vision, the Bush Doctrine of 2001, which lacks vision, is similar to the Wilsonian worldview, a unilateral patriotic conservatism principally linked to the military-industrial complex and financial corporations. Its vision is different. It needs to instill fear and admiration for the United States, with a concept of democratic nation-building based on the American managerial model. The approach no longer needs the multilateral UN system, or even at times NATO, flirting with private military companies and other subcontracting militias. The objectives of the neocons in the war on terror is a changing of the guard in the Middle East and in Africa, the halting of progressive regimes and aligning all others with the American worldview. Make the American army the premier army of the 21st century, more flexible and easier to deploy. Following the footsteps of the Bush administration, the Obama administration has abandoned the victims of the dominant order, leaving them without options. This leaves the door open to the proliferation of disparate groups of terrorists. The defense establishment maintains a budget of $500 billion, 2,500 military programs, as well as a clear, established and anti-terrorist program in conjunction with Europe and Japan, and consolidates AFRICOM. Our Africa Command is focused not on establishing a foothold in the continent, but on confronting these common challenges to advance the security of America, Africa, and the world. A document that was released in January of this year, January 2012, and it's, uh, it's, it's called the Strategic Guidance for the 21st Century. It was a document uh, approved by President Obama, uh, uh, developed by Secretary of Defense Panetta and uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Dempsey, um, that outlines the, the global uh, defense strategic guidance which will guide the U.S. military uh, well into the future. But when you read the document, you will find that the word Africa appears precisely once one time. And so some question that that says, well, does that mean that the United States military uh, does not really think very seriously or is not very committed to African security matters? When you look at the list of tasks that are uh, assigned to the Department of Defense, the tasks which my nation expects our military to accomplish, you will find some very uh, consistent and very relevant priorities for those of us who operate uh, with our African partners. These, in, in, these in include countering violent extremist organizations, transnational threats, uh, illicit trafficking, countering piracy, uh, the phrase we use, building partner capacity, I, I think it's better to say enabling the capacity of, uh, of, of other states to be able to not provide not only for their own security, but to contribute more effectively to regional security as well. Uh, developing uh, uh, nations' capabilities to uh, deal with humanitarian assistance and disaster relief materials and contributing to regional security.
looks like the AFRICOM is a military outfit. Isn't it a military outfit? Sir, yes, sir. It is military. We're part so of that's what literally if you go around and ask African leaders, which members have done, and, and you look at uh, experts' testimony, it's hunger, disease, international warfare, oppressive regimes, oppression, poverty. Those are the primary things that Africa needs help with. Those are not military uh, focused items. All right. So the question really becomes what the heck are we doing? So, you know, AFRICOM is a military led group over there to lead up this charge. It looks like you're going over to protect oil and, and fight terrorists the same misguided way you fought, that we fought terrorists in other places. General Rob Baker. Over the last 11 years that these transnational threats exceed the ability of any one nation to defeat. And it's only when you can collaborate and work together in a coalition that you can defeat this kind of threat. We want to be the security partner of choice uh, for all of the East African militaries. And I want every troop in this command to understand what they're doing and how what they're doing supports the security of our nation and the security of American citizens in the region. come to speak to you and explain that there is no conspiracy theory. There is a global geopolitical struggle going on in which Africa is a key component. The best example is this military base. It is in Stuttgart and I intend to visit it in a few hours after this event to tell the people in charge the same way we intend to tell the German parliamentarians that we do not want them to move to Africa and that they shouldn't even be there and shouldn't be here. This base violates Article 25 and 26 of the German Constitution which stipulates that German soil cannot be used to prepare or carry out aggression in other countries. There was absolutely no consultation of the German Parliament to establish this base here. For the first time Due to our efforts, 30 questions have been submitted by Linker to the Parliament that is about to prorogue. For the first time, the government will have to explain why they would allow the use of German soil to launch drone attacks and other military interventions on the African continent. The capitalist system has entered a deep crisis, which is also a capitalist crisis. In the case of Africa, this translates as the failure of the neoliberal agenda. Over the last 30 years, we have witnessed the deconstruction of states by denationalizing, by liberalizing, and by reducing even further the limited sovereign spaces like education and infrastructure, which were barely embryonic and fragile at independence periods. More importantly, the majority of our elites, co-opted by imperialism, didn't manage to lead this fragile sovereignty. This explains how during the decade of the 90s we witnessed a paradoxical phenomenon. An increasing growth rate and widespread export of raw materials and a growing gap between the haves and the have-nots. This is not exclusive to Africa, since the whole world is set up the same way. If we look at the 
global household distribution of wealth, we see that 2% own the majority of the wealth. The vast majority of humanity that doesn't have access to credit live in precarious situation or in poverty itself. And Africa is fully caught up in that. Africa is still locked up into an unequal international division of labor in which its sole role is to provide cash crops and minerals. Since the process of industrialization is so underdeveloped, its human power is desperately underused. The world order barely taps into these human resources and then only selectively for capitalist expansion. This is done by two categories of transnational corporations, the seniors and the juniors, which will profit from the space created by the dismantling of sovereignty to grab our resources, which is obviously the complicity of our leaders, and sometimes with resources to war. The case of the Congo is perhaps the most tragic. People around the world have access to electronic devices, cell phone, computer, fiber optic and satellite technology, but this is done using coltan, mainly acquired through war, plundering of the Congo, which continues to submit to this dispossession. In almost total indifference, the Congo has paid for the last 12 years with 6 million dead to allow our lifestyle to continue. This comprador model, in which the regime owes obedience to foreign power, is now exhausted, as we see in the case of the Maghreb. In the Maghreb regimes, like those in Tunisia of Ben Ali and Mubarak in Egypt, massively supported by Western capital, were touted as the democratic model for the continent. They were thrown out by their own population and abandoned by the foreign godfathers. Arising out of the crisis, we see the growth of new bilateral and multilateral partnerships. Players like China and India have changed power relations over access to African resources. The OECD DAC countries are going to use NATO and countries like Qatar and Saudi Arabia to support two strategies. The first is destabilization and the other is to subvert revolts or potential revolutions. Regimes established in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya were not just there to put a break on the revolutions of the Maghreb people and to stay within the confines of the neoliberal strategy. This actually represents a redesigned map of North Africa, but also the Horn of Africa, as well as the Middle East, with the objective of destabilizing Syria, Iran, and China. This represents the downfall of the dominant powers of the 20th century, confronting the power of emerging countries. Even the weakest African country has a rate of growth greater than the Western countries. We must say it and reiterate it. Remittances from our migrant workers are greater than official development aid. NEPAD, the new partnership for Africa's development, is not even a plan for continental integration. Rather, it is a partnership with the G8 countries that has not yet been financed. The G8 has spent far more on useless war than it has on NEPAD. There is a huge degree of cynicism behind the way they use war and manipulation to manage the continent. One example is the way their strategy worked out in Rwanda, Uganda, and Congo. This strategy was frustrated by some African countries who refused to accept the partition of the Congo. The intervention of South Africa, Zimbabwe, and Angola caused great consternation to the West because it frustrated their plan. 
because they saw how Africa could manage their own affair if they united. This is the reason why the Western powers want to make us believe that we cannot defend ourselves and that justify the existence of Africa. We should even question the morality behind the United States using its military might to divide the world. CENTCOM here, PACOM here, and AFRICOM. And they hide it here. The majority of Germans have no idea that this exists here. There were no discussion, I tell you. The majority of Africans don't know it either. The majority of these countries have been infiltrated by these forces. And I am telling you that you cannot bite the hand that feeds you. This has left our countries dependent on foreign transfusion to the extent that our elites are unable to protect us. Given their resources, the Americans could very easily base Africa in their own heartland. The other powers should do the same. When the Amenas oil refinery was attacked in Algeria, the jihadists, as they are portrayed, killed a number of hostages, including Japanese. This allowed the Japanese government to proclaim the need to protect their own citizens, if other countries can do it for them, and to have their own base on the African continent. And as I speak, they have just obtained that base. We can argue about what a base is. Let's leave semantics out of this. Any opening for a military presence, material support, logistics, and military intelligence can be considered as a base. In that case, Africa has been swamped. There cannot be development in Africa as long as there is conflict or the means to foment conflicts exist. There can be no development if we don't become aware of this situation. We have to realize that each and every one of us has a responsibility for this situation. In Germany, many of the Africans I talk to about all of this are afraid to speak out against the base because of work and immigration reasons. I understand. But I say, don't be afraid. This is the most basic of your fundamental rights. Understand that many Germans don't want the base any more than you do. It is your right as African to tell the world that you don't want this country to be used as a platform for the destruction of your continent. It is your absolute right. You must explain it to them calmly, intelligently. We are against the manipulation of these conflicts. We are against this Africa emptying of Africans that they want to create. We can demonstrate our position through concrete action. Write to your parliamentarian. Tell your representative to introduce these demands into the platform of this organization. So from country to country, the clamor will be heard in Addis Abeba. Those who pretend to listen to us in Addis will realize that we are so numerous that they cannot resist the tide. And I can assure you that Nelson Mandela, who has reached the end of his lifespan, would be very, very proud of the struggle that he led. That it was not restricted to Southern Africa and that Africa will change the face of globalization. The Western powers have chosen this very special moment on the threshold of the 21st century, France in the forefront, to join with countries like Qatar to undermine the Libyan state. I'm not here to praise Gaddafi, but what must be understood is that he was allying himself both with the West and against them. He joined the fight against terrorism at the same time as he renounced his own terrorist activities. He provided enormous support to the African Union with the aim of creating an African currency and provided access to satellite communication systems and promoted continental integration. He has eventually been assassinated by the same new allies he had chosen. Dès hier, la France, le Royaume-Uni, les États-Unis et les pays arabes ont adressé au colonel Kadhafi et aux forces qu'il emploie l'avertissement suivant. En l'absence d'un cessez-le-feu immédiat et d'un retrait des forces qui ont attaqué les populations civiles au cours des dernières semaines, 
nos pays auront recours à des moyens militaires. Cet avertissement a été repris par tous les participants au sommet qui vient de s'achever. Le colonel Kadhafi a méprisé cet avertissement. Au cours des dernières heures, ses forces ont intensifié leurs offensives meurtrières. Les peuples arabes ont choisi de se libérer de la servitude dans laquelle ils se sentaient depuis trop longtemps enfermés. Ces révolutions ont fait naître une immense espérance dans le cœur de tous ceux qui partagent les valeurs de la démocratie et des droits de l'homme. Mais elles ne sont pas sans risque. L'avenir de ces peuples arabes leur appartient. Even before this declaration, President Sarkozy has already been arming the fundamentalists of Syria and Iraq. Even worse, some of these weapons, in addition to others, had been forwarded to Tuareg militants following the old strategy of De Gaulle and Mesmer to create a kind of amazic state between Algeria and Mali. The failure of this state at the time, despite of the effort of Oufoué Boigny and some other French African leaders to create it, had not stopped Sarkozy from trying it again. And again, it is through Mauritania and President Abdelaziz that these dissident elements will be introduced in Mali and supported. Of course, one can blame the Malian authorities for this negligence, along with the incipient corruption endemic to the majority of states under structural adjustment tutelage, which has set up this scenario. Tumani Touré operated within the military maneuvers of NATO. Even more seriously, once his country was occupied, following the model of the Côte d'Ivoire invasion, an embargo was imposed after the military coup at the end of his mandate. And I can get into greater detail uh, during this question period. The weapons, which had been ordered to defend the sovereignty of Mali, ended up stalled in the embargo. Mali had no ability to defend itself against the forces backed by the foreign interest, which had more or less reason to demand secession. All African states have secessionist tendencies resulting from the historical division of territories, and which can only be transcended by pan-Africanist practices. Nonetheless, Mali fell apart in a matter of hours. Both its political and military classes were divided. In addition, France owes a debt to Mali. We should never forget that. Let's remember that the Senegalese tirailleurs were mainly Malian who pacified, quote unquote, the whole continent of Africa, all the way to Madagascar, who also supported France through two world wars. Very clearly, the Malians have given the French a hero's welcome for helping them remove their own pests who finally vanished into the mountains where attempts to dislodge them are underway. The raison d'etre behind all of this, despite two different administrations, i.e. Sarkozy and Hollande, is inherent in the difference between France and France-Afrique. France-Afrique is a network representing military, industrial financial interests with links to French multinationals and with their tentacles inside Quai d'Orsay, Elysée and Matignon, which ties to the Masons, which has a many connections in France as they have in Libreville, Dakar, or Niamey. It is this system that sustains France and its overseas territories. The different France of Sarkozy and of Hollande fought for the preeminence, just as NATO countries were trying to re-establish their bilateral dominance over the African countries, which had been undermined by China India and other emerging countries. The response has been to reimpose the hegemony of the West over the African continent and warn all other powers that Africa is their turf for the 21st century. <laughs> Le mardi 9 novembre 2004, après deux jours de quasi-guerre entre la France et la Côte d'Ivoire, 
les militaires français et les manifestants ivoiriens se retrouvent face à face, en plein cœur d'Abidjan, à l'hôtel Ivoire. Vers 16h15, l'armée française ouvre le feu. Ces images sont filmées par la télévision ivoirienne. Bilan, 7 morts et des dizaines de blessés selon Abidjan. Dans les jours qui suivent la fusillade, les autorités françaises donnent plusieurs versions des faits. Michel Alliomari n'évoque pas les tirs français. Euh, C'est qu'il y a eu des échanges de coups de, et de tirs entre euh, la foule, euh, les, les jeunes patriotes et euh, les soldats militaires et gendarmes ivoiriens euh, qui étaient en interposition entre euh, la foule et les blindés français. Le général Poncet, qui dirige l'armée en Côte d'Ivoire, admet les tirs français, mais seulement pour riposter. Les tirs sont partis sur nos forces depuis les derniers étages de l'hôtel Ivoire, la grande tour que nous occupions pas, et depuis la foule. Dans ces conditions, nos unités ont été amenées à faire des tirs de sommation et à forcer le passage en, en évitant, bien évidemment, de faire des morts et des blessés parmi les manifestants. Mais euh, je répète encore une fois, les premiers tirs n'ont pas été notre fait. Le chef de la gendarmerie ivoirienne que nous avons interviewé lance la polémique. Il accuse le colonel français qui dirigeait les opérations à l'hôtel Ivoire d'avoir provoqué la fusillade. Il a donné l'ordre de tirer. Il n'y avait pas de tir auparavant. Il n'y avait pas eu un seul coup de feu avant que les militaires français commencent à tirer. Et c'est le, leur chef. Ils n'ont pas tiré au hasard les militaires français. C'est leur chef de corps qui a donné l'ordre de tirer. En réplique, le chef d'état-major français monte au créneau avec une nouvelle version des faits. Nous avons eu le sentiment d'un bout à l'autre que ce fameux colonel de gendarmerie qui accuse aujourd'hui l'armée française avait en réalité cherché à provoquer l'incident. Que ce sont les gendarmes ivoiriens qui ont cherché à se saisir à un moment de certains de nos soldats pour les, pour les envoyer dans la foule. Et c'est là que nous avons dû ouvrir le feu, après les tirs de sommation. Voici donc les explications données par le colonel Destremo dans une interview à nos confrères de Libération le 10 décembre 2004. Il ne parle plus de tirs venus de la foule. Il confirme que son dispositif a été débordé par les manifestants. On n'arrivait pas à éloigner cette foule qui de plus en plus était débordante. Sur ma gauche, trois de nos véhicules étaient déjà immergés dans la foule. Un manifestant grimpe sur un de mes chars et arme la mitrailleuse 762. Un de mes hommes fait un tir d'intimidation dans sa direction. L'individu redescend aussitôt du blindé. Le coup de feu déclenche une fusillade. L'ensemble de mes hommes fait des tirs uniquement d'intimidation. On se rapproche de la vérité. Reste une question. Comment des tirs d'intimidation ont-ils fait 16 morts et 76 blessés par balle, selon une enquête du journal français Le Parisien D'après l'armée française, la fusillade a duré environ une minute. 2000 projectiles ont été tirés. L'ordinateur contient une présentation de tous les armements français en Côte d'Ivoire les matériels de transmission et l'organisation des troupes. Il contient aussi des centaines de fiches sur les principales personnalités ivoiriennes, en commençant par le président Gbagbo. Sa vie est détaillée jusqu'aux plaques d'immatriculation de ses voitures banalisées. Ça vous a surpris que les Français fassent des fiches de renseignement comme ça, confidentielles, sur vous et... Mais on a peur quand on voit le blindage de sa voiture, sa voiture. La maîtrise de soi dans des situations dangereuses impose de grandes qualités morales et physiques. Et cela demande tout à la fois sang froid et courage, discipline et détermination. C'est ce visage que nous ont montré les soldats de l'icône sous les ordres du général français Another example of hypocrisy and betrayal. Hadafi, after supporting electoral campaigns in Europe and Africa and opening his country to economic liberalization, is hunted down by his alleged powerful allies who locate him via his Iridium cell phone. It is likely that a secret service infiltrator was amongst the insurgents who participated in his assassination. The des impacts 
qui indique un tir au pistolet plutôt qu'à la Kalachnikov, la proximité des deux blessures, le remplacement, j'en suis personnellement convaincu. Tout semble indiquer que Kadhafi a été mortellement blessé au thorax par un tir à bout portant dans l'ambulance qu'il évacuait. L'accord de coopération. Et ensuite, nous avons aussi signé un accord de défense. C'est le seul pays avec lequel nous avons signé des accords de défense avec l'Afrique du Sud. L'accord de défense signifie lorsque nous sommes agressés, ils peuvent venir en notre aide. Et c'est ça. Et c'est dans ce cadre que les forces sud-africaines se trouvent en République centrafricaine et ils, sont, ils exercent ces activités depuis bientôt cinq ans. It is the elite at the head of these countries who have renounced the interests of their own countries, who have been fooled into believing that we cannot defend ourselves. It is they that need us. It is Africa that will make globalization more human. If we have not understood that, we do not understand anything. Therefore, this base must get out of Stuttgart. The drone must not be launched from here. They have understood this very well and they have set up facilities in Spain and have many entry points in Morocco, Senegal, Chad, Gabon, etc. Maybe our struggle is already in vain. Maybe it is already too late. Is it still possible to change the outcome or are we preaching alone in the desert? Major difference between the 20th and the 21st century for Africa is the failure of pan-Africanism and especially the failure of neoliberalism, the depoliticization by managerial governance, the co-opting of our civil society. The failure of UN multilateralism has produced transnational forms of regulation of the world order where the major role is left to NATO and transnational corporations. A recent French defense report reveals that in the 21st century, Pan-Africanism is a threat for Western interest. I want to make it very clear that our position is not anti-American. It is a Pan-Africanist internationalist position. The goal is to be against militarism and to change the course of Africa's development toward a self-reliant development disengaged from the capitalist and imperialist system. Prenons en compte ce qui s'est produit. Une victoire, une victoire pour l'Afrique, une victoire contre le terrorisme et la fierté que nous devons avoir là aussi. Parce que moi j'ai été salué en Afrique, non pas pour ce que j'avais fait mais pour ce que j'avais décidé. Ceux qui ont agi, ce sont les soldats français. Non, nous avons vaincu le terrorisme au Mali, nous ne l'avons pas vaincu partout. Il y en a encore, vous avez raison, notamment dans le sud de la Libye. Il y en a qui se sont échappés autour des pays voisins. Et donc nous devons porter notre soutien à tous ces pays-là qui font appel à nous, mais nous ne ferons pas la guerre partout. Là, nous l'avons faite parce que nous étions appelés par un pays ami, nous étions soutenus par l'Europe et dans le cadre de la légalité internationale. administration said that they would move away from this frame global war on terrorism but in many ways they have continued down the same path it, it may just be you know global war on terror but it's very much um, more of the same 
And, and what we see in the African context is that the U.S. has focused on the security sector, on, on essentially a militarized engagement with Africa. I think it is alarming, um, first, that the U.S., um, through AFRICOM, um, heavily involved in, um, in Libya, um, sending um, uh, weapons to Libya, uh, weapons that then, together with weapons that were in caches of the Gaddafi government, uh, that then found their way across borders to Mali, um, where, you know, um, and so I think there was a sense, and there still is a hope, that there can be leadership from the Obama administration that really causes um, the, the, the so-called war on terror and also countering China. So I, I, I do think that that becomes a, a key determinant in um, U.S. policy at this time, you know, some people call it the cool war between China and the U.S. that's that's ongoing now. But I think um, clearly, when you when you see, um, you know, the, the the rise of Africa, you know, Africa has six of the top ten growing economies in the world. Um, I think it is incumbent upon the U.S. to engage more strategically. At the same time, we'll work with our NATO allies. Germany joined NATO in 1955 in the face of significant popular resistance. There is resentment among some Germans about this cavalier attitude, as well as an acknowledgement of the contributions of the Western Bloc in the reconstruction of Germany, which is tainted sometimes with mixed feelings on major global strategic issues. Underlying the military question and the issue of global partnership is a less known taboo. It is an economic issue. Germany, which has the largest reserve of gold in the world, is demanding that its 674 tons of gold be progressively repatriated by 2020. Its gold is being held at the U.S. Federal Reserve. Washington has refused to repatriate the gold of the Bundesbank, hidden also amongst his other allies out of fear for a Soviet attack. Does this question of not wanting to become further divided on this issue explain Germany's acceptance of the AFRICOM base? Germany has also asked France to return its gold, 11% of its total reserve. Could the war in Mali, major producer and reservoir of gold, have something to do with the imminent currency war, whereby China puts its yuan currency against gold to convert more than a trillion dollars in U.S. bonds that it holds? What is behind the normalization and the pacification of Mali and of these agitations of AFRICOM? Are the Germans aware of the issues surrounding AFRICOM? Of course, Africa has a lot of um, very important uh, resources. <clears throat> and we think this is not legal that on the German of the German bottom there are planned uh, such activities because we know many people were killed, not only terrorists because the drone <clears throat> war is a war we, you, you cannot you have sometimes no responsibility but this is why we start to acting and to raise this question also in our movements in Stuttgart because it's not very well known what really happened. We have the AFRICOM and we have also the OICOM. So two military bases in Stuttgart <laughs> and after our history in Stuttgart I think we have to win the peace and not the war. Do you know AFRICOM? No. At all? And the baby? No. <laughs> okay. Do you know Africa? I'm going to get an Africa. I'm going to get an Africa. And I'll explain what that is. I'm going to get an Africa. Okay. Okay. So you don't know Africa at all? Okay, that we film. Africa is the American headquarter for um, surveillance and uh, to the, the military headquarter for for Africa, the American headquarter. So do you like the fact that you have this base here? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> we have one reason. Um, 
Oh, it's too complicated. <laughs> okay. Could be an organization who helps um, group people in Africa or who supports them and their circumstances there. It's a military base. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so, how do you feel now? Um, I didn't expect. <laughs> you didn't expect a military base in Stuttgart? It's been here for a couple of years now. Okay. Yeah. So what do you think? Should we keep it or close it? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a hard question, but um, um, what does this military base do so that we could think about our answer? Maybe? It's an American base okay. that want to protect Africa against terrorists. That's yeah. what they say. I'm totally against violence, so, yeah. well, if I ruled the world, there would no, not be any military base at all. Good. We choose you to rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you know AFRICOM? It's a military base in Stuttgart. Military base, yeah. For Africa. An American military base. Yeah. yeah. I know. You know it? Ich habe doch gespielt Musik. Sie haben da Musik gespielt? In den Kelly Barracks? Ja, aber das war doch das war eine, eine Zumba-Party. Das war auch ah, okay. für die Familie, für Freunde. Für ah, okay. So, you, you play music for the people around the, 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 the base? Ja, also dort, ein, ein, ein Base. Yes. Okay. Music is better than war. Yes. <laughs> At the heart of a valley, Stuttgart stands pretty and discreet, damaged by the bombings during the Second World War and now completely rebuilt. The city's motto is Stuttgart and more, where the future meets business. It was at the regional parliament that the establishment of AFRICOM was decided. Like most people living in Germany, residents of Stuttgart are unaware of the existence of the base. We cannot wait to see it. The American Garnison houses four bases in Stuttgart. The AFRICOM base benefits from the city's long history in the automobile industry, with companies such as Porsche and Daimler-Benz. The city benefits economically from the base. It is located in Kelly Barracks at the edge of the city. The base is huge. It probably houses between 3,000 to 5,000 people, including Americans and African soldiers. Legally, this is German territory. Our intention was to hand over the AFRICOM Go Home declaration to an American officer if he or she would accept it. Just as I am explaining what I was going to do before the camera, I'm surrounded and arrested by US military police. My passport, my camera person IDs are confiscated. You are subjected to a very long interrogation. More and more soldiers approach us. They insist they want to take our camera. We refuse. They insist again, we refuse, we negotiate. We ask that the German police come, and they finally arrive. They also review our documents, which are still in the possession of the Americans. The Americans finally agree to return my passport and the camera's person ID, and allow us to go on condition that we give them the film in this particular segment. Therefore, you will not see the part of the film regarding our interrogation, because we had to give them that portion of it. This is what happens for an hour and a half later, so you cannot see that part. There is no sign around the base that indicate that we are prohibited from filming. Fearing that kind of incident might take place, early that day I filmed the front of the base from the other side of the sidewalk, which is also German territory. We were escorted out of the area by the German police, who were, I must say, somewhat sympathetic to us. Later on, while our vehicle was parked close to the location meeting where I was invited to speak, it was searched by unknown individuals. One must question the legality of all this intimidation. It's very important because it was here in Germany in 1885 that we had the Berlin Conference that divided the African continent and we cannot use Stuttgart 
as another phase to recolonize the African continent. We will expect for the next election to have clear answer on how, without consultation, was established this military base. And we will listen to him in the open microphone um, in the... Den ägyptisch-senegalesischen Politologen, Herrn Assis Salmone Fall, aus, derzeit aus Kanada. Und zwar ist heute Abend im Forum 3 um 20 Uhr eine Veranstaltung. Und da geht es um die Afrikom, um also Militärbasen in Deutschland. Die Afrikom ist ja die Militärbasis, die in stuttgart mürgen ist. Der Sirok und den Aziz zum Thema Afrikom. Hallo, ihr beiden. You know, the question here is not to bury the station, but to bury the Afrikom. The military base is an American base that is the front of the NATO base. It aims at controlling militarily the resources. The riches of Africa is oil, is diamond, is coltan, is uranium, and also to fuel wars in order to have the pretext of intervening. And we will not accept that. I wanted to see the base, the African base. And I know that I've seen it today, and many of you probably have never seen it. So as you know, the African hospitality is great, so we have no problem of accepting Germany as an African state. <laughs> Despite of the fact that the country is no longer in the Cold War, and despite of the fact that there is now a unified Germany, you don't have your say as citizen on this global issue. June 18, 2013, a couple of days before the end of the mandate of the German parliament, the Linke party secures from the government majority response to the 30 questions that they asked regarding the AFRICOM base. For these courageous members of parliament, and for us, this is a small victory. The party was not questioning the legitimacy of the AFRICOM base. However, deputies are preoccupied with the potential breach of international law by Germany and in finding out whether they are aware of the reprehensible actions of AFRICOM perpetrated from German soil, such as the use of drones for targeted assassinations. In response to the questions asked, the government simply declares that up until now, they are not aware of any acts of drones planned or conducted by the American forces in Germany. The German government maintains that it does not have anything that establishes any breach of international law or of the national constitution in the agreement of cooperation. In the era of the transatlantic free trade zone, the opposition and a part of the public and the media accused Chancellor Merkel of being aware of the U.S. PRISM surveillance program and of not protecting her own citizens from it. In the name of the war on terrorism, bilateral co cooperation regarding digital intelligence and defense between Germany and the USA has dramatically intensified during the eight years of the Merkel administration, even up to the point of spying on allied NATO members. In April 2013, according to the newspaper Der Spiegel, 12 public servants from the German intelligence service, BND, were sent to Washington, D.C. to visit their NSA counterparts for guidance and advice. During a period of economic crisis, capital accumulation competes with military proliferation. One struggles against economic depression by using war and propaganda. Surveillance is pervasive everywhere, infiltrating every corner of democratic resistance. Behind this issue of spying and other underlying issues lies the question of German sovereignty, 
still under the tutelage of the winners of the Second World War. Und wir haben jetzt festgestellt, dass es dennoch alte Abkommen gab von 1968, als in Deutschland das sogenannte G10-Gesetz gemacht, gemacht wurde, was die ähm, Arbeit der Geheimdienste regelt, dass es da noch Abmachungen mit äh, den drei, Alli drei Westalliierten gab, ähm, die darauf hingedeutet haben, dass in bestimmten Fällen ähm, die sag ich mal, Souveränität unseres Geheimdienstes nicht voll gewährleistet gewesen wäre. Und wir haben jetzt die äh, ganzen Diskussionen ähm, um die, die Zusammenarbeit der Dienste genutzt, um diese alten sogenannten 68er-Vereinbarungen mit Frankreich, Großbritannien und den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika zu beenden, ganz formell durch verbalen Noten austauschen, das heißt zu beenden. Und damit ist auch in diesem letzten Bereich unsere Souveränität hergestellt. Und ich glaube, damit haben wir eigentlich das Problem gelöst. On September the 3rd, 2013, the Linke MPs, dissatisfied with the vague answers of the Merkel administration, filed a complaint against the German government regarding the targeted assassination of AFRICOM, and the use of the Rammstein base to launch attacks against Afghanistan and the Horn of Africa. This will obviously embarrass Washington, which continues to justify its military crusade. The Iraq war is now over. The Afghan war is coming to an end. Osama bin Laden is no more. Our efforts against Al-Qaeda are evolving. And given these changes, last month I spoke about America's efforts against terrorism. And I drew inspiration from one of our founding fathers, James Madison, who wrote, No nation could preserve its freedom in the midst of continual warfare. James Madison is right. Which is why, even as we remain vigilant about the threat of terrorism, we must move beyond the mindset of perpetual war. And in America, that means redoubling our efforts to close the prison at Guantanamo. It means... It means tightly controlling our use of new technologies like drones. It means balancing the pursuit of security with the protection of privacy. And I'm confident that that balance can be struck. I'm confident of that, and I'm confident that working with Germany, we can keep each other safe, while at the same time maintaining those essential values for which we fought for. Our current programs are bound by the rule of law, and they're focused on threats to our security, not the communications of ordinary persons. They help confront real dangers, and they keep people safe here in the United States and here in Europe. But we must accept the challenge that all of us in democratic governments face. To listen to the voices who disagree with us. To have an open debate about how we use our powers and how we must constrain them. And to always remember that government exists to serve the power of the individual and not the other way around. That's what makes us who we are, and that's what makes us different from those on the other side of the wall. NSA, and the intelligence community in general, uh, is focused on getting intelligence wherever it can, by any means possible, but it believes on the grounds of sort of the self-certification that they serve the national interest. Uh, originally, we saw that uh, focus very narrowly tailored as foreign intelligence uh, gathered overseas. Now increasingly we see that it's happening domestically. And to do that, they, uh, the NSA specifically targets the communications of everyone. It ingests them by default 
it collects them in its system and it filters them and it analyzes them and it measures them and it stores them for periods of time simply because that's the easiest, most efficient, and most valuable way to achieve these ends. The, the greatest fear that I have regarding um, the outcome uh, for America of these disclosures is that nothing will change. Um, people will see in the media uh, all of these disclosures. They'll know the lengths that the, the government is going to grant themselves powers unilaterally um, to create greater control over American society and global society. It is not the charisma of Obama or other leaders that is criticized here, but rather a system established by imperialism. Generalized monopolies with a system of dispossession and accumulation destroy human beings and the environment. 95% of the weapons distributed on the African continent come from the outside, and one can witness the militarization, an increasing number of conflicts, and the proliferation of weapons that kill more people than all of the pandemics. Our own lack of organization allows for the manipulation of these conflicts and fighting amongst ourselves. Rodriguez, AFRICOM commander, urged Pentagon to boost its AFRICOM spying by 15-fold. More drones, more satellite images, more targeted assassinations, the continental monitoring, drones with longer flying periods for surveillance and attacks, those so tiny that they could fit into a garden or even a room. Here, reality is stranger than fiction. Engineers spend their time making this weaponry more sophisticated, weapons that can monitor and punish. The collective imperialism and disproportionate militarization under the dictate of a senile capitalist system is putting our planet at risk. The sophistication, proliferation, and miniaturization of weaponry hide behind the mask of legitimate war, the responsibility to protect and preemptive war. AFRICOM's targeted assassinations, as well as networks or satellite surveillance, are presented as a cybernetic story which hides ulterior motives. Create a global consensus for war, isolating the emerging powers, which upsets imperialism's global hegemony and pulls the entire world into this strategy for war. In doing so, they criminalize pacifism and the internationalist discourse. Our countries are forced to fall in line, to play the game whether they want to or not. Under the veneer of economic and trade agreements, hegemony and diplomacy have served the interests of oligarchic powers. The drone strikes that we see are a foretaste of the use of perpetual war, illustrated by the scramble for Africa. That is why we must stand up against all of this and avoid buying into the pro-war syndrome and the strategic security balance. Anyone that goes along with the current makes the crocodile laugh. On top of the growing network of drone bases across the continent with their surgical strikes and high-speed connectivity and with no boots on the ground, which is left to the surrogate forces, there are still more bases than the base of Stuttgart. There is a Spanish base, one in Florida, the Sicilian base at Sigonella for the Marine Corps, a base at Mulworth in England, forces in deployment all across the continent, Kenya, Niger, a drone base in Djibouti, South Sudan, one in Senegal, one in Burkina, in Liberia, in Ethiopia, in Uganda, altogether installations in more than 30 countries. AFRICOM even drafted the plan for the African Union's standby forces, which is supposed to maintain continental peace and will be operational by 2015. They vary military exercises on the African continent. Part of the capacity needed by the AU is the establishment of the African standby force for rapid deployment in crisis areas without delays. The forces that are against us are, and I use the word most carefully, formidable. Is the issue of being in alignment or an ally still up in the air 50 years later? Nothing prevents us from revisiting our alliances. Of course, while relationships between different forces and logistical issues have pushed us into alignment with NATO, nothing prevents us from having more South-South connections. What's important in this present climate regarding the issue of supranationality is that we insist on a referendum on the presence of foreign bases. Even more critical, 
countries convinced that they defend their territorial integrity are in fact being co-opted by NATO and intelligence services which demand they accept its security agenda and the deployment of Africa. All of this brings to mind the old division between the Monrovia group and the Casablanca group. In 95-96, Grillo proposed Africa Pax, but in vain, an intercontinental force based on 1958 Kwame Skrumah's model. He suggested an African high command and an African legion. The idea of the Casablanca group was to defend the Pan-Africanist sovereignty of the continent and to offer an alternative to the neo-colonial collective agreement. What we need to understand is that the goal of supranationality goes back to the earliest origin of Pan-Africanism, firstly African-American, anti-colonial and anti-imperialist. This project was undermined by the Monrovia group, aligned to the West and interested in creating only microstates. Under the insistence of the integrity of the borders, they created the Organization of African Unity. For decades, it stood off as a symbol of the failure of supranationality. Today, we understand how the Monrovia and Casablanca group succeeded in dividing the African continent. Announcement by the Ethiopian Prime Minister Dessanin in May 27, 2013 of the formation of the Rapid Intervention Force of 4,000 soldiers for African conflict was heralded as an unprecedented event to justify the delay of the African standby force expected in 2015. An intercontinental defense force mimicking the Nkrumah model of the 1958 High Command and Legion on four continental areas. The African Union has applied the same idea on five zones, pretending that it will not be guided by NATO. But it should be understood that the African Standby Force has followed in the steps of the African Union in 2002, and the adoption of the Protocol of the Security and Peace Council of 2003 that stipulates that an African Rapid Defense Force be deployed. The political and institutional constraints are far less important than the financial and logistical tutelage. The standby force received $10 million for peace building, but this is an insignificant sum. NATO has provided the capacity building reinforcement, has operationalized the standby force and given targeted training. Since 2009, it has been training senior officers of the African Standby Force. The Command Interarm Center is based in Lisbon. The African Union is itself requesting military expertise. The heads of state are the very ones asking for training and military maneuvers. These maneuvers demonstrate how AFRICOM is reframing the continent and playing the role of intervener. That time of year when our military communities come together to support each other through the combined federal campaign. But this year is different. We're now facing the reality of steep budget cuts that are impacting each and every one of us. Cuts that aren't just having an effect on mission accomplishment, but also on our everyday community services. All this creates additional stressors when we're already trying to cope with the rest of our normal day-to-day -day challenges. We're all feeling the budget squeeze service members, civilians, and our families. This is why the CFC needs your support now more than ever. Our teammates are counting on us and our generosity to help them. You can do that by supporting one of our local charities or the other 4,500 other organizations that make up CFC. So if you can, make a difference today and donate. Thank, Thank you, you for, for your support. support.
use a cosmetic treatment of our states that gives them a democratic face. They are in fact much more vulnerable to coming under military and economic networks, organized along macho, ethnic or social bellicose lines. Their development capacity was aborted by liberalization and they have difficulties in reaping the economic advantages of their resources. These comprador regimes fall easily into dependence and are indebted to imperialism, which rigorously imposes constraint by force on their time and space. So they can allow some forms of transnational operations which permit selective social integration and members of their elites or some migrants to leave the continent. But most of the states are unable to control deep social inequalities constantly impacted by the fight for survival and poverty. People continue to resist, despite heavy repression and every method of depolitization used internally and externally. Many escape to religion or self-alienation. Decolonization is not pseudo-liberation. Trying to regain our sovereignty raises questions about who we have become and who we will become, but we have been reduced to the level of butterflies, mesmerized by the light. pour laquelle je suis venu en Afrique, c'est dû au fait que l'Afrique monte, se développe et qu'il relève des intérêts des États-Unis, pas que des intérêts de l'Afrique, il relève des intérêts américains de ne pas rater cette opportunité de renforcer, d'approfondir ces partenariats potentiels qui existent ici. Il va s'agir d'un continent qui avance, c'est un continent jeune qui est en plein essor et, et plein d'énergie et C'est la raison pour laquelle beaucoup de pays du monde y consacrent beaucoup de temps. see the parade of this post-colonial army of tirailleurs, we wonder if it is still possible for us to transcend our hybrid and fictive nation-states and rise above our ethnic, clan-like or religious divisions, while skirting the dead end of predatory capitalism. We must, at all costs, make a pan-African and internationalist leap forward, so that both our elites and our populations can become aware that the militarization of Africa will lead us nowhere. Militarization attracts, fuels, and fosters conflicts. African sovereignty begins with the dismantling of all foreign military bases. Can we still have confidence that a pan-African reality is still within our reach? But it is incompatible with our present state of dependence and tutelage, as well as populist, ethnocentric, and fanatical religious networks and above all, entities like AFRICOM or any other foreign base. To the youth of Africa, I say have faith in your future. Stand up against AFRICOM. Africa will either throw off her bonds and be free, or she will cease to be. Long live a free Africa. <laughs>
Thank <laughs> you. 